very much. Welcome, welcome everybody to this international technical webinar. Today we will be talking about climate smart agriculture and in particular we will be talking about the challenges of, of climate change and the importance of biodiversity. I wanted to mention that the, this is one of a series of uh, international technical webinars that the FAO eLearning Academy is organizing uh, together with uh, UNESCAP, which is the United Nations uh, Economic uh, Social Economic um, Commission for Asia and Pacific, together with Agrinium, which is a network of 20 um, agricultural based uh, universities. Um, so we will be having a series of these webinars throughout uh, 2020. And uh, the idea of these webinars really is to have a, it's to have a, a common space where we can share uh, experiences, where we can share lessons learned, where we can share innovation, and where we invite the different actors throughout the world to participate and to contribute. Uh, so let me introduce myself. My name is Christina Petracchi. I am the leader of the FAO eLearning Academy. And today I have the pleasure to have with me, with us, uh, Federica Matteoli, who is uh, an, F, uh, an FAO Natural Resources Officer, who will be also uh, delivering a presentation together with uh, Damiano Lucchetti, who, uh, who is an expert in uh, sustainability and sustainable development and biodiversity. And also we have the pleasure of having with us today uh, Philippe Lenonceau, who is a senior scientist in, uh, in RAE, which is uh, in a French institution. So um, without, <laughs> without no further ado, Federica and Damiano, you have the floor. You have about 20 minutes and uh, we will then give the floor to Philippe. Thank you. Damiano, can you share the presentation? Hi to everybody. My name is uh, Federica Matteoli. I am introducing this uh, presentation. Today we will, with Damiano Lucchetti, will introduce you on the fantastic uh, uh, world of uh, climate smart agriculture and biodiversity. Damiano will explain to you the link between biodiversity and agriculture, the risk for agriculture if we don't take care of biodiversity and what we can do. In the second part of the presentation, I will um, share with you the concept related to climate smart agriculture and the link between uh, biodiversity with uh, some examples of uh, projects and the practices and what we can do to work uh, uh, with, on uh, climate smart agriculture and biodiversity. I leave the floor to Damiano for the first part of the presentation. Thank you, Federica. Um, okay. Just a very quickly um, a brief overview on what is biodiversity, what it means for agriculture. Uh, just for the beginning, when we say agriculture, we mean uh, agriculture in terms of crops, uh, livestock, uh, forestry, fisheries, and aquaculture. So if we don't specify it, uh, normally agriculture includes all of this. So what is biodiversity? Biodiversity is a term that has been created to indicate the variety and the variability of life on Earth. It has uh, three levels. The genetic level, which uh, refers to the diversity within each species. It's very important because it gives uh, the opportunity to adapt to different conditions. Then there is the species level, which uh, are the different species that we know are on the planet. And then there is the ecosystem level, which is uh, the area, the physical place where living organisms interact with the non-living, let's say, part of the environment, like water, climate, temperature, soil, and whatever. So what is biodiversity for food and agriculture? We use this term to indicate uh, the variety uh, of life uh, at genetic species and ecosystem levels uh, that contributes to agriculture and food production. 
So for instance, uh, the genetic uh, level, we call it normally genetic resources, uh, is the diversity of all crops uh, and breeds uh, that uh, farmers use uh, in their farms uh, and in their pastoral systems. While the species are the wild species usually harvested like uh, for the fisheries uh, or even the trees uh, for forest trees. And the ecosystem level includes uh, two levels. One is the agro ecosystem, which is the area where uh, an agricultural system is uh, implemented. And the wild part of the ecosystem that is outside the farm that has an impact on the farm, let's say, pollinators that come from outside, soil microorganisms that are important for production, and my colleague Philippe will speak about this in the next presentation, or the invertebrates and the vertebrates that are useful for integrated pest management so that they eat the pest and the insects that can ruin the crops and so on. So FAO uh, does uh, a number of periodic assessments. In this case, I wanted to highlight the work of the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. They produce uh, uh, the state of the world on genetic resources uh, to assess the state of genetic resources for food and agriculture uh, in the world. And uh, we realized uh, that the Commission uh, tells us uh, the genetic resources are under threat. So uh, one point uh, on genetic resources that is very interesting is that uh, we need to use genetic resources, genetic resources, otherwise we lose them. So we say use it or lose it. And why we need to use them? We need to use them because they uh, are useful for a number of reasons. Let's look, for instance, at uh, animal genetic resources. It refers to more than 38 species uh, and almost 9,000 breeds of domesticated birds and mammals that are used in agriculture and food production throughout the world. They produce products like uh, meat, milk, eggs, uh, fibers, but they also produce like manure for fertilizer and they produce power for transportation, they have a social and cultural value. The value of animals uh, in a farm is really invaluable. It's not only meat from cows, and it's really very broad. And different breeds provide different products, and especially they adapt to different conditions. So we can say that diversity of breeds, but diversity in general, is a key element to increase resilience in the face of climate change. Okay, what the commission has uh, uh, identified is that about 17% of breeds of animals are at risk of extinction. And even worse, that 58% of these breeds are still under an unknown risk status. Okay, another assessment, uh, which was very recently done, uh, is that on biodiversity for food and agriculture. So it's fully inclusive of all biodiversity. And uh, they also realized from uh, country reports, uh, countries uh, have reported that their biodiversity is declining. You can see from these uh, images here, a, a summarized uh, synthesis of the results. From the first line, you can see how all the genetic resources in the different fields, uh, crop, uh, livestock, uh, fisheries, they're all declining. But also the different uh, um, natural, let's say, biodiversity that has a positive impact on production is declining. So soil biodiversity, uh, pollinators, uh, uh, wild food species and so on, they're all declining. And uh, an additional the third line, you can see that ecosystems that are useful for uh, food production, like uh, 
coral reefs, uh, which are important for fisheries, uh, forest areas, and so on, they are also either declining or under degradation status. Okay, uh, now we want to briefly go through another global assessment, the IPBES, uh, the assessment uh, of the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And they identified among the different things, uh, the main drivers of biodiversity loss. And these are changes in land and sea use, direct exploitation of organisms, climate change, pollution, invasive alien species. And it's easy to see here how unsustainable agricultural practices contribute to most of these drivers. And in fact, several of these drivers are interrelated amongst themselves. Okay, now we have seen what is the problem for biodiversity, but what are the risks for agriculture? Um, through the different assessment and of course also after FAO uh, experience uh, in several projects around the world, we have seen that uh, the, the loss of genetic diversity, loss of crop and wild relatives, loss of species, loss of uh, habitats, degradation of ecosystems, they all cause uh, a negative impact to agriculture because they, they, are, uh, um, they cause a loss uh, of ability to adapt uh, to a changing condition, they increase uh, vulnerability to pests and disease, and they conduce to loss of productivity and so on. So there is a, a direct link from the loss of biodiversity to food insecurity. So loss of biodiversity has an important impact on agriculture and food security. Having said that, what can we do? And my colleague Federica will continue the presentation and will, will tell you more about this. But let me say a few very general things. We, we spoke about the animal genetic resources. So uh, the commission also produced a, a plan of action on animal genetic resources where countries identified five main uh, things that need to be done to address uh, the loss of uh, animal genetic resources. So we need to improve knowledge of the characteristics and trends of the different breeds, strengthen institutional frameworks for the protection, improve awareness, education, training and research, and strengthen breeding strategies and programs and expand and diversify conservation programs. And also, <clears throat> from the assessment on biodiversity for food and agriculture, we have seen how countries have uh, reacted to the loss of biodiversity for food and agriculture. So several uh, countries reported that biodiversity friendly practices were increased to, let's say, to react to the loss of biodiversity. In this and in the next slide, you can see a compilation of replies from countries where they indicate what management practices and approach they have used in the different production systems to cope with the loss of biodiversity. It's very interesting that they say that they had the impression that these practices improved biodiversity and production, although they need to improve knowledge of uh, these practices uh, and they would like to have more research uh, on these topics. Having said that, uh, I would like to move uh, the presentation to Federica, who will tell you more on the climate smart agriculture practices. Federica, you can take over. Thank you. Thank you, Damiano. Uh, let me share with you my desktop. Okay. 
as Damiano said, um, FAO uh, and the, the countries uh, um, have already identified some practices that can be used to, um, to work on biodiversity, um, but we can say also that we can, uh, uh, FAO is already working on these practices and uh, many of them are considered also climate smart agriculture. Let me introduce uh, this approach that was created by uh, FAO after many consultations inside the, the house and outside with uh, external uh, institutions in um, uh, 2010. And climate smart agriculture is an approach uh, to guide the transformation and orientation of agricultural systems to work uh, uh, on food security and to ensure food security in a changing climate. It's not uh, a set of practices that are universally applicable. We, uh, because the, the concept is, uh, the approach is a con context and location specific. What does it mean? This means that um, and a practice that uh, can be considered climate smart is not, uh, um, we can use in a specific context in a, a specific situation and not uh, everywhere. Um, uh, but what is uh, in general climate smart agriculture? Climate smart agriculture is uh, um, based on three pillars. The first one is uh, uh, sustainable uh, um, in incrementation of uh, uh, produ agricultural productivities and incomes and uh, linked with uh, uh, adaptation and uh, resilience of people. So uh, the idea is to build the resilience of people and food system to climate change and where it's possible to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So the three pillars are the base of climate smart agriculture. Uh, an example of, on this is uh, um, the Climate Smart Agroforestry Systems uh, is a project in the Central American Dry Corridor and uh, is a typical example of integrated systems. Um, we, you can see at the top of the presentation, I used the, the, the icons for, climate smart, for the, on the three uh, pillars of climate smart agriculture to indicate that in this context, of, in this project in, in agroforestry, you can see um, results for the first pillar, so increase productivity in a sustainable way, adapt to climate change, and mitigate uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, I use this icon uh, to um, uh, graphically um, focus on the fact that this project is also working and has effect on positive effect on biodiversity. You can see in the first column that the first pillar uh, the project can increase uh, uh, soil fertility and increase biodiversity, increase the crop yields, land productivity, and increase biodiversity of the farming system. In the second pillar, you can see that the project uh, increases the resilience to draw, uh, increasing soil uh, um, moisture contents. And, we, and the, the idea was to higher water infiltration rates and water deten retention capacity of soils. So, and the reduce loss of water to surface runoff and uh, reduce erosion and the loss of topsoil and reduce crop damage. For the third pillar, the idea is that uh, the, the, the project reduced the pressure on forest and uh, reduced the, the emission of greenhouse gas and gas uh, to avoid the burning forest burning. And, um, uh, and the other result was to remove of greenhouse gas emission from the atmosphere to carbon sequestration by soils and the storage as a soil organic carbon. 
I mean, in general, agroforestry is, is considered climate smart practice. And, um, and, the, and agroforestry has also a very good um, impact on biodiversity. Uh, trees can also provide a habitat for wild species, which uh, uh, increases the local biodiversity. And in some cases, in some projects, uh, using of uh, um, native tree species should be selected to contribute to the conservation of local, local biodiversities and create habitats for beneficial species, such as uh, pollinators and natural predators of pests. Uh, there is another project that I couldn't uh, that I uh, share with you because uh, the presentation uh, is uh, too long at the moment. But uh, we are working also in Ecuador on uh, cocoa production, and we are increasing also using the uh, chakra system is an agroforestry traditional uh, system where we uh, are increasing uh, using the native trees of cocoa to um, increase the productivity of a traditional cocoa, like the white cocoa. Uh, the next slide is, uh, um, um, you can see at the top uh, that this uh, um, practice for is, um, can enhance on the form biodiversity. The, the practices are intercropping, crop rotations, um, and can have a very good impact on diversification of farm income. Uh, so the first pillar is, uh, uh, is um, is to come to consideration and greater resilience to pest and disease also under changing climate conditions and announce ecosystem service and production factor pollutions. The other practices uh, uh, that uh, are um, considered climate smart agriculture are for livestock production. In this case, we the example is on uh, grazing management, rotational grazing. Uh, you can you improve grassland productivity. Uh, and uh, the, um, the practice uh, um, avoid the uh, land degradation and uh, restoration of uh, degraded pastures. And there is a greater resilience to uh, weather extreme and climate variability. And there is also the higher quality digestibility of uh, forage and reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from enteric fermentation. We know that pasture intensification is, is a generally a threat to biodiversity, but also the grassland abandonment is also a threat to biodiversity. And the um, highest diversity of wild species is, is often found in uh, pastures with uh, intermediate level of management intensity. Um, Certain grassland uh, management practices uh, uh, setting up buffers to protect uh, wild habitats can introduce supplementary feeding or nutrition management uh, can provide multiple co-benefit for carbon sequestration and land restoration. And um, so the well-managed uh, livestock also provide a service to the environment shaping and maintaining uh, specific habitats. Another practice that I is consider climate smart and uh, has a very good uh, impact on biodiversity is, is the well-managed mangroves and their biodiversity. Uh, the results of this uh, um, uh, practice is uh, when we have healthy coral reef and mangrove systems, uh, which provide habitat to the wealth of biodiversity, so we can have high capacity for sequestering and storing carbon. So the, the, the th third pillar is, a, is, a, um, is a considered, is a, one of the results. Acting as natural barrier, the, the mangroves can acting as uh, natural barriers to physical impact of climate change. For example, um, 
for example, for extreme events, such as uh, typhoons, tsunamis, floods, and can contribute to the sustainable supply of fish, can improve resilience, uh, contribute to stabilizing the availability of nutrition for food, and uh, um, increase income for people and can enable the development of stronger social systems and create livelihood options. Um, so the ideal habitat for, and the mangrove can be also ideal habitat for many fish species. So the link, when, the link between um, well-managed mangroves and uh, climate change is very clear. Um, we can see in this presentation, I want to, to raise also another problem that is very important in, uh, when we talk about climate change, agriculture and biodiversity. We know that is water. Water um, is um, for agriculture is a, a, an important element, but is also an important element for uh, biodiversity. And water scarcity, unfortunately, is expected to intensify as a result of climate change. And um, the, um, the link between water and biodiversity um, uh, is on more frequent and, and um, severe draw are having an impact on agriculture production and uh, as well as on biodiversity and ecosyst ecosystems. So uh, we can see that uh, um, after uh, projects that FAO are developing in, in, um, in, uh, in several uh, countries, landscape management strategies uh, can be used and can um, and include bu buffer strips along water uh, bodies and can and has a, often a, and are often used to reduce the run of nutrients, chemicals, and sediments from farming, helping to improve water quality. Also, the ecosystem degradation uh, is a contribution of uh, of uh, uh, in several major water-related disasters. Uh, healthy ecosystems are um, incre increasing uh, and is in, in recognized as a means of disaster risk reduction. The ecosystems uh, are also um, being used to uh, increase or replace built disaster reduction infrastructure, such as dikes, and often with uh, uh, significant economic uh, gains resulting from reduced operational and capital cost. Federica, and, we, uh, yes, Federica, we will have to come to an end because now Philippe will have, otherwise we're running late. So please okay. try to conclude. Yes, so uh, the um, uh, climate smart agriculture, uh, FAO has identified five uh, actions to, uh, ec to uh, achieve, uh, implement climate smart agriculture and achieve uh, CSA uh, results. And here you have the five actions. The first one is expanding the evidence base. So the assessing the situation is absolutely important, but this is also important not only for climate smart agriculture but also support biodiversity and uh, identifying evaluating potential climate smart and, and options including uh, biodiversity approaches and uh, the second step is uh, supporting enabling policy frameworks so um, according to national development priorities we can prioritize uh, biodiversity and climate smart agriculture options the other step Step is to strengthen national local institution on climate smart agriculture and biodiversities and enhancing financial options so to uh, include the financial options in the uh, national strategies and implement projects uh, at the field level uh, projects that can include CSA 
and uh, biodiversity practices. Uh, what do we have to do to achieve this goal? First, integrate biodiversity in agriculture and climate change policies, projects and activities. Re-educate the field to a more varied, sustainable and traditional practices with the support of uh, government and technologies because moving from a traditional, moving from um, and business as a usual uh, agriculture to a more sustainable and climate change and, and taking consideration by diversity is, is a, um, could be a problem for farmers, especially because uh, they have to rebuild, re-educate their agriculture and the support from government and technologies at the financial and at the technical level uh, is absolutely important. Economic and political framework need to be strengthened to help decision makers. And also um, we need to review, harmonize and adapt existing policies related to climate change, inserting climate change in agriculture and inserting CSA and biodiversity approaches to reduce, to address inconsistencies and gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you Sorry, very I will be late. much, uh, Federica. And I would like now to give the floor to Philippe. Meanwhile, maybe Federica and Damiano could have a look at the questions in the Q&A section uh, so that we, we answer those questions just after Philippe uh, has finished his presentation. Philippe, the floor is yours. You have 20 uh, minutes. Thank you. OK, uh, thanks, Christina. I am um, just... Um, uh, trying to share the screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. <clears throat> so, uh, um, very happy to share with you uh, some views on uh, uh, soil biodiversity uh, as a major challenge uh, for uh, uh, for uh, agroecological uh, practices in relationship uh, with uh, multi-performance. <clears throat> As we are all aware of, uh, the current intensive uh, agro uh, uh, agriculture systems are not uh, uh, sustainable. And uh, there is, uh, at the same time, um, a major expectation for agricultural systems not only to provide food of adequate quantity and quality, but also to contribute to climate mitigation, uh, to preserve resources. Then there is a huge to move from uh, intensive conventional agriculture to ecological intensification with agroecology. Uh, this transfer from uh, conventional agri agricultural uh, systems which rely mostly on uh, mechanization and uh, inputs and which minimize biotic interactions on biodiversity, have to move to agroecological system, which in contrast uh, value biotic interactions, biodiversity, and harness uh, this biodiversity to intensify ecological processes. <clears throat> Talking about uh, biodiversity, uh, soil are a major, one of the major reservoirs of biodiversity. Soils are full, full of life, uh, as it is indicated on this uh, figure. And uh, uh, there are more, uh, there is a, a biomass which is higher <clears throat> under our feet than above ground. And that biomass is not only huge, it's also very diverse with uh, animals, with microorganisms. Today, we will focus mostly on microorganisms. That's to say bacteria, archaea, and fungi. <clears throat> Soil biodiversity uh, deliver a range of ecosystem services. Uh, today, we will focus on the services which are related 
to crop production and to uh, climate regulation through geochemical cycles. <clears throat> Despite the importance of uh, the biodiversity for ecosystem services, as indicated uh, previously, uh, this diversity is uh, limited to threats due to the intensive, intensive agricultural practices, loss of uh, above ground biodiversity, over grazing, soil erosion. On some maps, have uh, predicted uh, the potential threats to soil biodiversity across the world according to the soil types, to the climate, and to the land use. If we wanted to uh, preserve our value and value soil biodiversity in agroecology, of course, it is necessary in first place to better know that biodiversity. And this requires in first place to know the genetic potential of this biodiversity and see how this genetic potential translate in activities and finally in ecosystem services. Of course, it's, it's uh, absolutely crucial to see how environmental filters, that is the soil, the climate, but also human activities, how they impact the biodiversity, but also the relationship between biodiversity and functioning. Characterizing uh, soil biodiversity is a very difficult task uh, because uh, microbes are very small. They are hidden in the soil matrix. And uh, across the years, uh, we have moved from uh, the study of specific organisms isolated from the soil on cultivated uh, on petri dishes to meta communities. Uh, the, the pioneer um, um, studies uh, aimed at developing a growing media to be able to grow those organisms, to then be able to isolate population on communities. But then we realized that uh, we were only able to cultivate a small fraction of the total biodiversity. And uh, the development of the, the DNA extraction directly from the soil has been a major step forward, which has allowed us, which allow us now to characterize the polymorphism of DNA and then uh, theoretically the total uh, genetic diversity of the soil. That has been also possible because of the very sharp decrease of the DNA sequencing thanks to major sequencing program, human genome, human gut uh, metagenome. It is now possible then to uh, characterize systematically uh, the soil biodiversity across a large scale like for example on those maps in France, but also in Europe, on all over the world. If you look at the map on the right, uh, you see that uh, the biodiversity is not evenly distributed. And uh, we have identified, uh, and that has been checked uh, in all kinds of situations, that the major driver of the soil biodiversity is in first place the soil type and then in second place uh, the type of land use. The fact that the diversity is not the same everywhere of course call for the use of referential to make a diagnosis of the soil biodiversity and those referential now allow to compare the actual value which is recorded on a given soil to a referential for uh, the type of soil where this analysis has been made with the kind of uh, land use that it's done on this soil. Okay, uh, so of course now if we want to look at the relationship between biodiversity and functioning, the major question is obviously what is the relation between uh, 
a decrease of a possible decrease of the biodiversity on the impact of the soil functioning. And here you have a classic experiment which has been made by Marcel van der Heyden, where he has increased progressively the diversity of arbuscular mycorrhizae on the left hand side. And then you see that when this uh, fungal diversity was increased, the plant diversity was also increased in such a way that the total productivity as indicated on the figure on the right has increased. This was uh, possible because of a, a better exploitation of the environmental resources, especially uh, may, uh, a better uh, phosphorus uh, uptake on nutrition. Yet, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, uh, in agriculture, there is a, a negative relation between the level of uh, the intensification of agriculture on the level of uh, mycorrhizal colonization, which uh, suggests that in very intensive uh, agricultural systems, we do not value properly mycorrhization and then the beneficial value of that plant microbe interactions. Another example uh, of the relationship between the biodiversity and the soil functioning is related to the carbon cycle involved, as we will see in a minute, in the climate regulation. Pierre Alain Marron uh, has uh, diluted the biodiversity of the soil, keeping at the same time the total biomass equivalent. And uh, as it decreased the soil biodiversity, as you see on this figure, it decreased also the soil mineralization of the carbon, which means uh, mineralization of organic matter is directly related to the level of uh, the soil biodiversity. Agriculture uh, contributes to climate change, but also agriculture is submitted uh, to uh, agricultural change. And we are ex exper uh, experiencing uh, uh, extreme events uh, in such a way that one may wonder what's going to happen in those extreme conditions in terms of a uh, process that we look at. And when we have a high uh, diversity represented here in green, we have a wide uh, uh, distribution of a given functional gene in a broad diversity of microbial population in such a way that even if the biodiversity is decreased in extreme uh, conditions, there is still population arboring this uh, functional gene and the process is still being expressed. In contrast, uh, when the initial biodiversity is low, the functional gene is only distributed in population which only occur in normal conditions or not in extreme condition in which uh, the process is not being expressed. Also, uh, since we are talking today about multifunctionality, it has been uh, clearly showed that uh, the multifunctionality, uh, which is expected from agricultural systems, is directly related to soil biodiversity. So in summary, yes, soil biodiversity is required for the stability of the agroecosystem in a context of climate change. And the biodiversity is required also for the expression of the multifunctionality expected from agroecosystems. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now, what can we do? Uh, in agroecology, we want to steer microbial communities to increase productivity on food quality, uh, plant uh, 
release a major part of their photosynthesis uh, around the roots under what's called rhizodeposit. This carbon source uh, sustains a abundant and very active microbiota, which is recruited by the plant from the soil. Uh, this recruitment is specific of the plant and uh, the cost for the plant of this uh, carbon release is balanced by the benefit for the plant for its nutrition and health. That's what we call the feedback loop. Uh, if we go a little deeper in the root, we will see that for legumes, that some bacteria, rhizobia, are able to make some new organs with the plants like nodules in which nitrogen is being fixed and being uh, uh, made available uh, to the plant. And there are also fungi that we've been referring before, arbuscular mycorrhizae, which uh, contribute also to uh, the plant nutrition. Uh, we will not go in that uh, in detail because we don't have time, but if you have questions, you are very welcome. There is a all a range of research now which try to identify plant threats which would uh, favor a beneficial uh, population of microorganisms and which could be including in plant breeding program. Just to illustrate uh, this uh, feedback loop with iron, iron is a very important element because uh, uh, Many people across the world are suffering from anemia. And then uh, the food product should have a, a, a high enough content in iron. Plants uh, require iron also. Uh, and uh, uh, plants support all the range of microorganisms which themselves need iron. So that means in the rhizosphere, we are in situation of iron stress conditions then the plant uh, select population which are adapted to these iron stress conditions because of the synthesis of the siderophore which show very high affinity for iron. This siderophore with a very high affinity for iron decrease the availability of iron for uh, phytopathogenic fungi, reducing then uh, the frequencies of root infection and then promoting plant health. And this ferricidurophore uh, uh, also promote iron nutrition and then promote plant growth and health. And then here you see again that the investment of the plant is being balanced by beneficial uh, effect on the plant. While we have been referring to the nitrogen fixation by legumes, it's a major issue for agroecology because it allows to decrease the use of uh, uh, chemical uh, uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, we want to value uh, the plant biodiversity on the microbial biodiversity. Here on this figure on the top, you have all a range of different plant genotypes which have been inoculated with uh, varieties of different genotypes of uh, rhizobia. And you can clearly see that the performance for uh, the nodule formulation vary greatly uh, among the plant genotypes, but also uh, according to the combination of the plant genotype on the microbial uh, genotype. And then uh, is research are running to find the more performant couple of the plant genotype on microbial phenotype, because as uh, it's indicated on the figure below, uh, the productivity of the crop will be related directly to the total nodule which are established between the bacteria on the plant. Agroecology is not only managing uh, soil biodiversity or plant microbe interaction, it's also managing plant plant interaction in relationship with their associated microbiota. Plant legumes have the ability to uh, fix nitrogen 
on promote the nitrogen nutrition of Graminaceus, which in return promote iron nutrition of the legumes because uh, with their microbiota, they have a very efficient iron uptake system <clears throat> in such a way that this iron contributes also to uh, enhancement of the nitrogen fixation and contribute in fine on the top of the productivity to a better quality of the grain, amino acid, uh, essential amino acid content and iron content, which are major issue for world nutrition. Just a, a short illustration of the pathogen regulation, thanks to uh, soil microbiota and the uh, rhizosphere microbiota. It's a classic example where it has been shown all over the world that uh, when you grow uh, wheat in a monoculture in the presence of the uh, phytopathogen Gaonomyces graministritici, during the first year, you have an increase of the very severe disease called Tecol, but then after three to four years, you have a decline of the disease. And this decline, called Tecol decline, is related to a building up of antibiotic producer. Um, what is interesting is the fact that the corresponding functional genes are distributed in different genetic background of fluorescent pseudomonads in such a way that even when the soil biodiversity differ from one soil to the other, the selection of this antibiotic producer always occur and this phenomenon always takes place. Of course, in agroecology, we are not going to promote uh, monoculture of uh, wheat, but uh, the output of this uh, experiment allowed, uh, for example, in orchard to do some intercropping uh, to suppress rhizotonia diseases, which were uh, impairing the replantation of uh, apple tree. Okay, uh, well, that was very brief, but uh, I'm sure you will have questions. If we move on uh, uh, to uh, climate regulation, we have seen that uh, the plant by uh, the photo photosynthetic activity fix, uh, nitro uh, fix uh, uh, CO2. When the, the crop is, uh, is ended, the crop residue go to the soil that contribute to building up the stock of soil organic matter and then to decrease the CO2 content of the atmosphere. However, uh, microorganisms may also mineralize this soil organic matter. This mineralization, by the way, is stimulated by the root exudate, which brings some fresh organic matter to the microorganisms, which become more active. That's what we call the priming, the priming effect. However, this mineralization releases some minerals for the plant, which are useful. So it's a kind of trade-off uh, between the storing and the mineralization of the carbon. We will have a chance to, to see that a little later. Okay, uh, so uh, in terms of carbon cycle, it's not only uh, biodiversity, which is important, it's also... Philippe, we have to come to uh, an end uh, very soon and start with the, with the um, question and answer session. So try to conclude. Uh... Uh, I was at 21 minutes. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, so uh, we discussed 25 minutes. That's going okay. to be pity if I stop now. Okay, okay, okay. But other 25 four, minutes, that will be fine. No worry. Uh, so, it's also a question of uh, uh, the network of, uh, uh, between organisms and uh, according to the land use, as you see uh, on, uh, on the right, the network can be a lot more tight and when the network is more tight, the transfer of carbon from above to below ground is higher. And of course, that uh, through fungi, and of course, that consequences on the carbon storage. And it's interesting to, uh, to notice that uh, this uh, network 
is becoming a lot more tight in organic farming than in conventional farming. So about the trade-off uh, I've been referring uh, before, uh, what is important to notice is when the plant grow, uh, then it's going to uh, take up uh, mineral uh, nitrogen, and then by default, that's going to be the destroying microorganisms which are going to be promoted, which are going to degrade the soil organic matter stock, releasing uh, nitrogen, uh, but at the same time, releasing CO2. In contrast, when the plant does not grow, uh, then there is a lot of uh, uh, mineral nitrogen available, and then the storing uh, is promoted. And then, of course, from that, we need to promote uh, um, agricultural action, which uh, only uh, allow, let's say, organic matter mineralization when the plant need those minerals to have a, a balance of this uh, trade-off of this disservice, which is the emission of CO2. So the, there is a connection, as you have understood, uh, between the, organ, the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. Uh, you have seen here that uh, uh, the mineralization of organic matter will release uh, ammoniac with the with afterwards the nitrification. Some, some uh, microorganisms have uh, the ability to reduce uh, uh, nitrogen until N2O, N2O which is a major glasshouse gas, whereas other can reduce until N2, which is uh, uh, harmful because, because uh, most of the gas we breathe is made of that gas. So uh, well, I will skip that slide uh, uh, to keep in time. I will just uh, I will just try to to make those two last slides about how to deal with multi performance uh, of agroecology in practice. Uh, there has been a, a major <clears throat> initiative launched by France, which is strongly supported by FAO, which is. Uh, how can we manage the cropping systems in such a way that we could increase by four per thousand the organic stock of soil in order to balance the CO2 uh, concentration related to human activities. And in France, there, have, there has been a, a modeling uh, work uh, based on land use, climate, uh, clay content on the uh, initial stock value uh, to see how we could gain in terms of carbon in the soil by appropriate uh, cropping systems, uh, expansion of cover crop, which means the soil is always covered, uh, no tillage uh, in order not to uh, uh, promote the mineralization, new carbon input, uh, expansion of temporary grass, agroforestry edges, and you see in those uh, arable cropping system, it will be possible to increase by 5.2 per thousand the stock of organic carbon. So that will be uh, uh, one of the last slide, uh, just one after and it's finished, uh, Christina, so no worry. Uh, we have to deal also with possible trade-off because we want the multifunctionality of the cropping systems. Here, it's a long-term experiment uh, at INRAE, close to Dijon, where we're trying to uh, develop uh, uh, cropping systems which rely very little on pesticide, wheat killer. And uh, one of the um, system, uh, S2, uh, which uh, hardly does not uh, use uh, uh, tillage or no uh, uh, mechanical weeding. Uh, that's where we have the highest emission of N2O, whereas we have the lowest, we have uh, also the highest uh, uh, carbon storage. So there is a trade-off between the two. And then we need to find 
the best compromise and uh, in terms of uh, climate regulation, the best compromise is S3 because uh, uh, we have very little uh, uh, mechanical work, uh, which means uh, uh, we have a good uh, carbon storage and at the same time, we have a very small emission of N2. Uh, in Dijon, uh, we have a local uh, uh, program of uh, the transi agroecological transition uh, in which uh, we make with the agriculture, with the farmers, uh, a shared diagnosis on shared decision in order to manage the soil in agroecological systems. We are looking at how to promote the legumes uh, cultivation all through uh, transformation distribution consumption. For example, the local cooperative has uh, made uh, two units to transform the, uh, the plant proteins. We are promoting uh, uh, the consumption of uh, plant proteins in the canteens and the uh, the, the carbon uh, footprint, footprint is being decreased all over uh, the food uh, uh, chain, including by short food chain supply. Okay, uh, sorry to, to have been a little long. Uh, I will be happy to answer the questions. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much to the three speakers, which actually have uh, delivered the three very complimentary presentations, which at the end show how basically we can reach uh, sustainability only through ensuring uh, and protecting biodiversity in all its forms from, from microorganisms to plant to livestock to animals. So it was uh, extremely interesting. Thank you very much. Now I would, give the, I would like to give the floor to Federica and to Damiano to respond to some of the questions that were asked. You have about uh, 10 minutes, and then we will give the floor to Philippe to also uh, answer some of the questions that uh, um, on, on, his, on his presentation. So please, Federica and Damiano, um, you, can, you can start responding to, to the questions. Okay, thank you. Um, may I start, Damiano? Okay, so I think, uh, I, let me say that uh, <laughs> it was very difficult to, to follow all your questions. Um, there are many, many questions, very, very, very interested, interesting, interested for me. Um, so the, the, the first one uh, uh, is um, from Milian Herbez. Sorry for the pronunciation. And um, the question is on, uh, on what are the uh, reactions of farmers when uh, su we suggest them to plant more trees in their, you know, at their land? How they react, especially if they are uh, limited by land surface? Well, first, we need, I need to, to explain a little bit better the process that we, in FAO, uh, we use when uh, we try to, uh, to answer some issues and the problems. First, we don't say, we don't suggest uh, something without involve uh, the stakeholders from the beginning. This is why, in, uh, for example, in climate smart agriculture, but this is a very um, important and uh, usual uh, way to work in FAO. Uh, first, we, uh, we have uh, a, an assessment of the situation. First, we cannot uh, uh, go to a country and say, you have to do that. We, we receive a request from the government because uh, FAO work with government and we analyze with the government and with stakeholders um, the situation, the possible um, uh, solutions and with people, in this case, 
also with farmers, uh, in, especially with uh, um, farmer organizations, we work with them to, um, to solve and to find the best solutions. So we cannot say, we, we cannot suggest something they cannot accept. This is the first uh, uh, something that I want to raise because it's important to understand this uh, point. Uh, another question, uh, uh, very important, is related to food uh, uh, waste. Uh, we are working uh, in FAO on food loss and waste and um, and there is a, one of the important uh, uh, topic that we are working on. And uh, also we, uh, as a Clema Smart Agriculture team, um, we are working with uh, nutrition and with our colleagues to identify uh, solutions for this uh, uh, very big uh, uh, problem. Um, I am available to, to is a long uh, discussion regarding that. Uh, we have uh, also um, a project ongoing, many projects ongoing and uh, assessments in different countries to uh, solve this problem. I don't think it is now the moment to to explain details, uh, uh, the solutions. Um, Damiano, do you want to answer some questions? I have another question, I think. You but, have uh, to unmute. I, I can... uh, we cannot hear you, Damiano. Please unmute. Yes, thank you. Apologies. Uh, apologies. <laughs> Uh, no, I was saying I'm, I'm really impressed by the number and the quality of the questions. And uh, in fact, uh, I spent some time uh, replying to some of them. Unfortunately, I'm not uh, expert uh, on all topics. Otherwise, I would spend the rest of the day replying here. So I had to choose the ones where I know a little bit. Um, um, and I have selected two to respond now. Uh, one is on the trade-off from Mr. C Mr. I believe Mr. Komanga Damarjaya um, on the trade-off between uh, the hybrid varieties, uh, the use of hybrid varieties for food security and the need to conserve genetic resources. Um, it's a difficult question and, and a very difficult answer, but, uh, and I think uh, maybe I, I haven't understood it completely, but um, it's since uh, ancient uh, times uh, that we start uh, hybridizing uh, crops and animals uh, for, for the use. So we, we have continued to do that for centuries and, and millennia, and we will continue. Still, this has an impact on the environment, we know, but that's the impact of humans, and uh, there is very little we can do on that. Um, I suggest, uh, everybody who is interested on these topics uh, to look at the work of the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. They have done a lot of work on all sorts of uh, genetic resources and uh, it, it's really very much uh, um, very interesting and very clear work that they have done. The second is uh, from uh, Maurillo Freire Jr. Uh, from Brazil, uh, he says, uh, on uh, uh, how, the, how we see the, the, the integrated systems uh, approach uh, that integrates crops, livestock, and forest. And this is something very, very important that uh, also FAO has started working uh, on uh, since uh, the last years. We have, uh, FAO has a program on integrated landscape and territorial approach that exactly deals with these, uh, how to integrate uh, ecosystem benefits uh, and ecosystem services uh, in agricultural production and how to integrate production systems uh, among themselves uh, so that they can have the co-benefits uh, so that uh, whatever is left over from crops uh, is used for feed, uh, for feeding animals and whatever the manure is used back uh, for the crop uh, and the forest provides uh, again shelter and food for animals uh, and uh, so uh, all these uh, is very useful to conserve ecosystems 
uh, to have a more sustainable uh, agriculture and in fact in many cases increases the um, the revenues of farmers so it also has an increased uh, um, economic uh, perspective let's say of course thank you thank you very much philippe would you like to answer i just wanted to mention to all participants that we will be preparing a document with with the the most frequently asked questions and the responses and that will be published and will be made available for everyone together with the recording of this session so you will always be able to have access uh, through uh, to to the responses to the presentations to the recording through the FAO e-learning center and we will be giving you the link just uh, very soon now Philippe would you like to answer to some of the questions yeah sure uh, thanks Christina uh, again uh, also yes yeah, a very wide range of question uh, very interesting uh, maybe I would start with uh, replying to Armand Richter uh, which uh, is raising a question on the education on smallholder farmers uh, through extension officer. Um, that was what I wanted to raise uh, in, uh, in the last uh, uh, slide. Uh, I was uh, urging a little because Christina was uh, putting the pressure on me. Uh, but I think it's a major issue. I think it's a major issue. What I wanted to share with you is that uh, here uh, we have experiences uh, where uh, farmers share experiences together with the scientists. So it's not a top-down relationship. It's more a participative uh, science approach. So we share together the diagnosis. The farmers trust each other and we go in the field together, we look at the biodiversity together, and we look together at the multi-performance of the different farm. And then when we share that, different decisions are being made by the different farmers. And the next year, we see together what are the different results of the action which have been taken by the different farmers. And from that, we build up together for the specific area, different options which will promote more or less such or such multi-performance, taking in account also the constraint that each farmer may have. So I think it's a, it's a very, very important issue. Uh, okay, that's one. Uh, there was a, a question on uh, on iron. I remember not where it is because there are so many. So I don't remember who raised that question. Ah, yeah. Anne-Marie Meyer uh, asked me if uh, I was aware of uh, any research that showed the relationship between iron content of edible plant and soil biodiversity. Why I have chosen this example is not just uh, for the fun. It's uh, first of all, because uh, iron deficiency is a very important uh, issue uh, in developing country, but more generally worldwide. And um, especially in the country which the people do not have access to meat and uh, it's a major issue to be able to bring uh, with the uh, with the uh, the plant food enough iron uh, to the nutrition. And um, in our group, we are working on plant microbe interactions, especially in relation with iron. So how can we promote iron by proper plant uh, plant microbe interaction? And indeed, we have published all the series of papers on that topic. And if Anne-Marie <coughs> Meyer want to send me a mail, I will be very happy to send her some uh, PDF. Maybe it would be ideal to add this in the question and answer documents that we will be 
sharing with all participants, it would be good to also add the links to the main publications that were uh, presented also in Federica and, and uh, Damiano's presentation, all the main, uh, the main publications, the flagship publications and the, uh, and the articles that you were mentioning, Philippe, that could be useful. So that would oh. really be good. Um, Okay, uh, maybe can I ask, uh, can I answer last one? Or? Yes, yes, of course, you still yeah? have time, okay. please. Okay, so a question by uh, Kaka Nadiraz uh, about uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, soil microbial diversity should be conserved and protected. Uh, what do you think of our gene banking of soil microflora could be important taking in account of the soil types, soil diversity and rhizosphere microbiome. Um, on the last, very last slide, uh, that maybe I didn't show because uh, of the lack of time, I shared with you uh, a slide with all uh, different kind of uh, international organization and initiative to characterize soil biodiversity well, worldwide and also uh, soil, micro, soil crop microbiome. So there is a world initiative on the characterization of the soil biodiversity. It's called the Global Biodiversity Assessment, which is run by the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. You have got the information on my last slide. And there is also another initiative called uh, the Global Soil Microbiome Initiative, and uh, their aim is to systematically uh, characterize the soil biodiversity at the world level. There are European initiative, it's a LUCA uh, Soil Initiative by GRC at the European Commission, and uh, there, are, there are also national initiatives uh, I can uh, also send you additional information if you wish on that. It's a very important topic also for diagnosis and action. Um, okay. Uh, uh, well, there is a, there is a, a question by Bear Argy. Uh, well, thanks for the, for the nice comment. Uh, she or he, uh, uh, thanks me for the uh, the great PowerPoint. It's always it's nice to to read, and great presentation. And uh, he or she asked me uh, what would be the effect on the ecology, on food security, as well as human health. So it's a very broad question, but uh, for sure. Um, the, the paradigm change with agroecology compared to uh, intensive uh, conventional agricultural systems is to consider uh, uh, the uh, resident organisms not as our enemies, but rather are our allies. And it's, 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 it's a major change of paradigm. Maybe, be, of course, uh, uh, in these resident organisms, uh, some of them are parasites and pathogens. But uh, from the experience we have uh, in extreme conditions where at a time it was advised to sterilize the soil to get rid of uh, uh, plant pathogens. And when that was done, then the pathogen recolonized even stronger uh, the soil. So the general idea is to consider as the agroecosystem biodiversity as a buffer, as a regulation, and higher will be uh, this biodiversity, higher will be the buffer. Uh, so it takes some time, it takes some years. Uh, so when we are discussing about food security as well as human health, of course, uh, uh, agroecology is not a question of getting rid of all pesticides. Uh, in some situation, we still may need uh, to apply pesticide. 
and uh, uh, food security is also a question of uh, uh, conservation of the food product. Uh, but in terms of human health, uh, of course, uh, if we decrease the use of pesticide, it's not only a question of the quality of the food, uh, but it's a question also of the quality of the environment. Mm -hmm. but in the initiative that we, have, we are developing at the territorial level in Dijon, we want to, uh, the citizen and the consumer to understand that if we promote agroecology, we promote for them the quality of the environment and the quality of the food, and we have a better reconsideration of the social role of the farmers and a better rewarding, including financially. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes very well this session. I just wanted to mention a few things before we we uh, we close this uh, this session, the, the the webinar. So the first thing I wanted to mention is that I would like to invite you all to visit the FAO eLearning Academy. All the thematic areas that were covered and all the ones that are covered in the next webinars and in the previous ones are area are thematic areas that are covered in the FAO eLearning courses, which are offered uh, through uh, the academy for free to anyone anywhere in the world as a global public good. So we also, I wanted to mention that on specifically on climate change and on climate smart agriculture, we have a series of courses which are very relevant to this webinar. So I would invite you to go and have a look. It's very easy. The link is just here. It's elearning.fao.org and uh, you can uh, directly access the courses. Uh, what I wanted to mention is that uh, you will be receiving a certificate of attendance of the webinar, but if you wish to, uh, to receive a certificate, a specific formal certificate of the acquisition of competences of some of the technical areas, I would like to invite you to do the courses and then to do the final test, which, are, uh, which, which is associated to the courses, because FAO has now started this new uh, digital badge certification system, which allows you to get a digital badge that certifies the acquisition of competences, not only of knowledge, but mainly of competences. And so uh, these badges are associated to the courses that are on the FAO eLearning Academy that we invite you to go and visit. I also wanted to mention that uh, on the 12th of June, you will be receiving an announcement because we will be officially launching uh, the new multilingual FAO eLearning Academy and you are invited to that webinar too. And that on the 24th of June, we will be having a specific webinar on soil restoration, soil um, on a sustainable soil, uh, management and on soil restoration. So this is um, uh, soil mitigation, soil, soil degradation, how to prevent it, how to, how to actually restore soils. So this is going to be the, the, the next webinar on the 24th of June. And on the 12th of June, we will be uh, officially launching where we will have a series of testimonials and partners throughout the world that explain to us how they have been using the FAO e-learning courses in their policy reform, uh, in their capacity development interventions, in university masters, because our courses are also used within university masters and university postgraduate programs. So uh, we are now concluding this webinar and I would like to start by thanking very much our three um, lecturers, our three presenters, so Federica Mattioli, Damiano, um, Damiano and, uh, uh, wait just a second, C. Lucchetti and uh, Philippe Lenonso. I would also like to thank our partners in this, uh, in, in this initiative, which are uh, Agrinium and uh, UNESCO. And uh, I also want to thank the people who are behind the scenes, who always with us, ensuring that everything flows well, which is uh, Aristide Bucare, Sara Ferrante, and Fabio Picinic. Thank you very much. 
And then I would really like to thank you all for your participation and for the excellent questions that you have shared with us. We will be preparing a document uh, that we will share with all of you, with, all the, with the responses, and the recordings will also be available uh, through the FAO eLearning Academy. Thank you all very, very much. See you, to, see you in the next webinar. Bye-bye. 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 Thanks to all of you, and see you in the next webinar, as Christina said. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.